this is LaQuincy Reed, and I'm with uh, Brian Booth, Craig, Craig, I get the last two parts, like, confused. I want to call you Brian Craig Booth, Brian Booth Craig. <laughs> <laughs> I have two, two last names. <laughs> yeah. Um, so go ahead and introduce yourself, and uh, we'll go from there. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a professional sculptor uh, doing representational work, mostly uh, cast in bronze. Uh, exhibit my work at Louis K. Mizell Gallery in New York City. New York City. <clears throat> um, and uh, I, I was uh, trained at uh, Penn State University in, in fine arts, uh, not in figurative sculpture, but uh, that's where I did my undergrad. I went to New York Academy of Art for my for grad school uh, to get my master's degree. That's where I went. And uh, I was started my career by working for Audrey Flack as a studio assistant, worked for her for about 10 years. Uh, overlapping that, I worked as a professor at the Lyme Academy College of Fine Arts in Connecticut for 11 years. In addition, uh, for the last 10 years, I've been running uh, workshops in Rome uh, and also in my, my studio here in Pennsylvania. And I travel around teaching workshops as well. So I have a multifaceted career of exhibiting artwork and teaching. Okay. So uh, you talked about you, you representing, you know, figurative work. Uh, can you go into more detail, kind of what are the things that inspire you and where do you draw your imagery from? Yeah, I, so I, uh, it's really, it's really hard to pinpoint specific works of art or artists that inspire me because I, I'm very open, open minded about the kind of artwork that I look at, the kinds of things that I read um, and interact with as an artist. I, my thinking is that I'm, I'm open to inspiration coming from any source. It could come from an artist. It could from, come from representational work, or maybe not. It could come from other kinds of artwork as well. Uh, it could be po poetry that I read, um, art history book that I read. So I'm, I, I don't, I have a very open-ended way of thinking about inspiration. I, I assume that all of the things that I am going to interact with as an artist are going to somehow enter into that that stream of consciousness when my hand gets in the clay. So one of the one of the ways I describe the process is that it's the meaning comes from the making. So the the inspiration and the idea comes out of the act of working with the material. And so all of those influences that are there are going to emerge organically. I don't have to I don't have to force them in. They're already there in my human experience, and my job is to respond to whatever's happening as I engage with material. So, so I don't uh, now. Obviously, because I do representational artwork, when I was learning and I was when I was mostly teaching myself how to how to sculpt the figure and draw the figure, because uh, I am mostly self-taught in this particular genre that I am, in, am, in, am involved with. But when I was learning, I did. There were certain artists that inspired me. Certain artists who. Uh, I was looking at to get some idea of how to sculpt the, the figure and also what that language was, what it, what it could communicate, in other words, what ideas could be could be Im immersed into that into that genre. So some of those artists would be obvious examples like a Michelangelo or Carpo or Rodin or Louise Bourgeois. You know, these are fairly obvious examples. But at the same time, I, I was looking at a lot of uh, uh, at the time that I was doing this, I was looking at a lot of process art. So I was very interested in, in the way in which material was a, a form of communication, not just, the, not just form, but the actual material that people's, people used. So I was looking a lot at people such as uh, uh, Martin Purrier, uh, Anish Kapoor, artists like that. So, so those two streams were in my were in my thinking early on but since then of course i expanded beyond that and find inspiration from all sorts of things I and mean, one of the main sources actually is working with models for example like the, the nature is nature is my intersection point right that's so uh whenever i'm working in the studio i always begin with a model and i don't finish with the model necessarily but i always begin with the model and looking for some sort of spark of an idea that comes from the interaction you have with another human being with nature. And so, so I, I see the, the, you know, you, it's kind of like David Lynch's metaphor of, you know, catching the big fish. I don't know if you've ever read that book, but you know, you're 
as an artist, you're, you're, you know, you're casting your line out and you're pulling in smaller fish, but you have to keep pulling in the small fish to get the big fish. Right. And it's a big ocean and there's a lot there under the surface. And so uh, I never, I never assume that my inspiration is only going to come from within the genre that I'm personally invested in. Right. And I think that's extremely important as an artist to think that way. So, yeah. So it could come from anywhere that the could come from music. I listen to, uh, like I said, poetry or, or different forms of art. Um, so what was the second part of that question? I know there was, there was a two part question. I went very long. No, you're fine. <laughs> I was just wanting to know what inspires you and, and, you know, kind of what your process was. And I think you pretty much, you know, answered that you, you draw from, uh, the model, you know, previous sculptors, uh, what you read and, uh, just anywhere really and you're not trying to focus on one specific thing as your inspiration you're always trying to find uh i guess little nuggets here and there to you know get that bigger that bigger chunk that that creates the inspiration i'm not trying to put words in your mouth if i'm no, that, that's right that, that's right that's right i think you know the um you know, in a way what you know the as an artist you know i see i see my job as being an antenna you know i'm not i'm not the i'm not the 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 to you to extend the metaphor i'm not the radio station broadcasting right the the content right i'm i'm the, i'm the i'm the antenna right so i'm i'm trying to i'm trying to trying to tune in to the rights to the right frequency with whatever it is that i'm doing in the studio in in my interaction with the act of looking with the model and also uh, manually forming the material. Um, that's my tuning, right? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tune into the right frequency and, and find some sort of something, some sort of inspiration that comes from those airwaves. And then the, 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 the end product is the speaker that, that, that broadcasts the thing that I'm trying, I'm trying to tune into. That's how I see my role as an artist. I'm not, I'm not the source of all things. I, I'm a filter, right? And all of my cultural influences, uh, the things that I've personally engaged with and, and had intentionally tried to dig into, those are going to be part of the part of the material that I'm working with as well. Uh, so, you know, as you as an artist, you, the the growth I think comes from being aware that whatever whatever you've done before whatever preconceptions you had before are 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 now being retuned because you have a whole different set of influences well i mean hopefully mm -hmm. hopefully you're not you know looking at the same thing you know 30 years from when you started hopefully you're you, you're you've grow, you grow in what what you think about the world about the role of art about your particular role as an artist the things that the information you've gathered uh you know, I was, I was, this is a bit of an aside, but I was looking at uh, a photo of myself with Audrey Flack, who was my, my uh, employer when I first got left grad school and, and uh, uh, also my mentor in, in probably the only real mentor I ha I've ever had in the arts. And I was looking at this photo and it, it's not that long ago, really, but I'm looking at it and I just looked at who I was back then. And I just thought, man, I didn't know anything. <laughs> what? I just feel, you know, I hope that in 30 years time, I look back at myself now and say, boy, I really, I didn't know. Like, what did I know? You know, I want to, I like that feeling. I like that feeling of that, that the, the world is open and I shouldn't limit myself because of my preconceptions of, of the way things should be. So uh, I think that's helped me in some ways, but of course that can also create, a bit of a crisis for people, right? To feel that sense of being unmoored in a little bit, right? You're out there fishing away a little bit more, but to me, that's more exciting. So, um, but that's my process. You know, what's really interesting is that uh, as an artist, you're, you're never really, you never really retire, especially in the visual arts. I mean, I'm, I guess there might be guys that, you know, never make any kind of art whatsoever. But you right. never really retire because your mind is always thinking about things and you're out, you're you're always trying to create things. So I don't know mm. if you ever retire as an artist because you're always trying to 
your your mind's always working to, to capture something and right. you know, get that idea out. And that's kind of that's kind of a, a weird concept, I guess, for people to kind of understand. Uh, I know one artist, he was doing an interview and somebody said, you know, what do you when do you plan to retire? And he's like, I don't think you kind of understand. This is this yeah. is this is a this is me. Like if, right. Well, the task. The task is never finished. Yeah, it's kind of like the, being a scientist. How could you ever retire as a scientist? Right? You never because there's no way you could ever know everything, mm -hmm. right? There's no ever, you could ever reach the end of that accomplishment. In fact, that's not even the goal. The goal isn't to reach an end. The goal is to just push the ball a little further along, right? And that will you know that will never ever end. It's an infinitely expansive uh, part of human experience to make things. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I had somebody ask me, ask me one time, it's, they said, well, don't you, do you ever get bored? Like, because to them, they see the same activity, but I don't, we don't, as artists, we don't see that. We see that activity manifests itself in, in so many ways. And in fact, with the, the, the hardest part actually is the thought that, is the thought that you can't do as much as you want because there's there's just so many possibilities yeah. and uh so the thought of retiring is just is crazy you know i uh, going back to audrey flack a little bit um i just saw her last week i'm doing a little bit of work for her again uh because she, she's going to be turning 91 in oh, may wow. Wow. He, he, i was in her studio and uh we're, we're talking she wants to finish up some projects that were kind of left years ago uh because I, I, I stopped being her full-time assistant probably, let's see, it must have been like around so, sorry, 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And occasionally I would pick something up for her to do it. But she shifted from sculpture back to painting. So she's been painting a lot. But then she's been reassessing like some of the sculptural projects that she had left behind. And so I'm trying to do some work for her to help these things get done. And she's and in her studio, she said, yeah, she's like, I just like time's running out. Like there's so much I want to do. <laughs> she's like she's she's like still has this desire to like finish these things and st like see this stuff to fruition and um that was really great because it's like you know that's why we're like even though she's you know uh, she's older than significantly older than me like i always felt very like very connected in a way it had nothing to do with age because our minds were like in the same place right you know she's She's the youngest, she's, she's got a young, she has a young mind mm -hmm. and a young heart. She's, you know, she still plays her banjo and, you know, she, she's a little more frail now, so she can't dance around like she used to, but her mind is sharp. Her ambition is still there. She still wants to make things. So here I am helping her and I'm like, and, and, and I told her, you know, in a, in a way you kind of, you're making me feel like youthful again, because I'm like, oh yeah, this is, it's never really ends. It just yeah. goes on. Um, so yeah, I think it was that story about Michelangelo. He, he, uh, he, like he, he was carving marble up until the very end, like a few oh, days before yeah. he collapsed. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, so yeah, this is this is the way it is to be an artist. Uh, it's more frustrating that we don't have enough time. Yeah, you know, that 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 life retires us. Yeah. Well, speaking of that, I don't know if. You probably do, but I have ideas in the back of my head, and then I have uh, sketches in my sketchbook. Uh, mm -hmm. I have clay sketches on, you know, my shelves and stuff, and they're there. They're they're ideas, but for some reason or another, I, I just haven't felt the need to, mm -hmm. to make those a finished work, and mm -hmm. other things take precedence. So I don't know if I'm ever going to get to some of my ideas. <laughs> Yeah. Someone's asked me, you know, where do you come up with your ideas? I have sketchbooks full of ideas and I have, you know, ideas that I just yeah. don't know which is which one is the one that's, that's going to take precedent over the other ones. That's the actual that's the real dilemma. That's that that's what I usually say when people say, well, you know, don't you don't you worry about getting like artist block or running out of ideas. No, the, my real problem is that I have so many ideas. I don't know which ones are the right ones. Yeah. Like I sometimes I, I start working on something. I, ha I have probably 20 five pieces in my studio right now that I'm working on. And I, it's almost a little, it can be kind of crippling in a way because it's not so much that I have a block. I, it's, it's more of a question of, am I doing the right thing? Am I giving my attention to the right one? Am I, am I, but then again, you can't, you, at some point you just have to, 
you just have to choose based on, I mean, I think it's based on what you love the most. That's how I would, that's how I would advise people if they have that many, like so many sketches, like you said, you have so many things that you want to do. Go with your, what you get them have the most love for. What do you feel the most like, like your own personal attachment to what do you, that's, I think the way to go. Cause if otherwise you start to intellectualize it or, or start to think from a market perspective or whatever, and those seem like less reliable guides to me. It doesn't mean that you'll always be right in the choices, but I, I, that's the only way I can proceed because otherwise I'll just, I'll get stuck. I'll just go in there and be like, ah, which way do I even turn? So yeah, the, 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 the lack of ideas is not the problem. <laughs> well, I the did, lack of time are the problem. Yeah. Well, I did want to back up a little bit and sure. I know a lot of sculptors who have worked for other sculptors. It seems like uh, I can't, I can't name too many that haven't at one point. Um, yep. uh, sounds like for you, as well as me, you know, I learned sculpture from the, uh, the sculptor that I worked for. And uh, the big problem that I had was, uh, or that I still even have, is because our styles are so similar, is mm-hmm. breaking free from what looks like his work and making things that are me. And yep. Yeah, that's that. I can I can see the the difference between yours and uh, Audrey Audrey's work. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yours is very. It's very fleshy. And it's it's and hers is slightly more abstracted. Right. And, uh, how did you figure out which direction to go? How did you figure out to how did you figure out your voice uh, while working with a, an artist? That's a very, very good question. I, uh, and I think you can add, we can add another layer to that, to that dilemma, which is people who go to, uh, they study in programs that have a very particular style, right? If they're, and I would just, now, obviously, in terms of art making, we're talking about representation or something that has a particular technique that is, that is imprinted on, on somebody, Right. Um, because I, in some ways that can happen even more if for people to go to a particular school that teaches one specific style. Uh, but so but the dilemma is the same. OK, so I mean, my my th- there are a couple pieces of advice that I give to people. One is to try to take courses with people, even if they're short courses with people who have a slightly different way of approaching it than what you may have learned. Right. But whose work you like, obviously, you have to respect these people. But um, that can help. That can help temper your your whatever habits you've developed from somebody else. Um, the other would be to, um, if you are working with for another artist, to make sure that you give yourself. It's hard to do because you, it could be if you're working full time. But to make sure you give yourself uh, space to do your own thing whenever you have the time because it's very easy to get subsumed by somebody else's style now the other the other approach could be to um to just work for somebody whose work is completely different from yours and has a technical part of it that you want to learn from but the style is so different that it could never really fully imprint on you but i think it's almost impossible for something not to imprint a little bit right uh now with audrey i um I, she was very good, like her projects were, you know, I was her full-time assistant, so to speak, right? But there were times when she would take breaks from projects or she'd be trying to get another commission and there would be a break in time, like a month or so. And then I would just, I would go into and do my own studies to try to, you know, think about what I wanted to make. Um, So, you know, the other thing is that it, I think it really is dependent on the person. and, And I was always very good at, imitating right like i could i could uh, um in fact i had a teacher tell me that one time in school they 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 said that during critique they said well the project was a very specific thing within a particular genre of art making and i was like a chameleon i could kind of like fit myself into it um and then and then switch to something else and i don't know why i have that that was something that maybe just maybe it's part of my like when my, when my brain works or the way i was the way I was taught, but I think if you have that ability, that can be very helpful because then you you can quickly get yourself out of whatever the other person was doing, 
Um, but you know, with, with Audrey, I never felt like it was really, I didn't feel like my wires got crossed too much. And, and I've never really, it's interesting. You, I mean, it's really a good question. It's a great question because I've never really thought that much about why my wires didn't get crossed. Um, part of it might be that, that like, she was a very, she was a very good person to work for because she would like, she, she, she respected my, my thoughts, my ideas. Right. So we would have conversations about art and that were totally separate from what she was doing, but just in general conversations about art and art making and my ideas and where I wanted to go. Um, and so she, it wasn't, I wasn't just living in her world. She was a good mentor. That's why I like to say she was also a mentor for me, not just an employer because uh, because I did have a lot of those kinds of conversations, but, um, but of course that's not going to be everybody's experience. And, 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 you know, like you work for another artist, I work for another artist and I recommend people that are coming up that are learning, you know, just beginning their careers. I recommend, I highly recommend doing that. Um, here's another way to, 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 I think to keep yourself, if you do work for another, another artist, particularly for a long period of time, how, by the way, how did, how long did you work for that? for the artist that you work for? I work for about six years. That's a pretty long time. I mean, that's that's a good amount of time to get imprinted, right? And yeah. you even said that that's a really good amount of time to be imprinted. Now, one of the things that I, I found for myself, now this isn't, I can't, anything I say, of course, you can't apply universally because everybody's different, right? But for me, one of the things that really helped me was like after I'd been working for Audrey for, let me think, I for about, seven years okay i i started teaching and teaching was teaching is like one of the best ways to get a reset because you have to you have to re-articulate everything that you take for granted and find a way to communicate it to other people if you want to learn teach <laughs> if you want to learn to teach because you'll realize how little you know just trying to stay ahead of the curve of intelligent students keeps you that <laughs> keeps you sharp i think that really helped me so um, those are the things that I think can, can, that can, people can apply again, like carve out some space for yourself when you're working for somebody else. Even if you have to do something in the evening for an hour or on the weekend, you just have to fight for that time, uh, in your own studio, carve out space for yourself. Secondly, uh, try to, try to, um, you know, try to engage with the person you're working for in a way that like, hopefully they'll be somebody like Audrey who allowed that kind of conversation. Um, and then teaching as well. I think those are, those are the things for me. I, but, uh, but it is a, it is a real dilemma. Um, you know, that, 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 that imprintation can happen for, for people that are working for another artist, but I still would recommend it. I, would you, would you agree? I think, uh, I think, uh, working for an artist is really great. Uh, mm -hmm. I learned even more because I was a middle school art teacher and a high school art teacher for about nine years. And wow. uh, it was crazy because I tell people, I'm like, I would look at their artwork and I'm like, why are you like, why are you doing that? Stop doing that. That doesn't look right. And then I would like take a step back and I'd look at my stuff and I'd say, oh, well, I'm an idiot because I do that. Like I have, and then your eyes kind of open up because you realize uh, in terms of technique, the technical mistakes that I was making. Uh, in terms of an anatomy or, you know, even compositionally, um, right. those things right there, that, 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 that pushed me even further in terms of, you know, my technical ability with uh, just teaching. And, you know, right. I'm still learning. Everybody's still learning. But, you know, that catapults but, you a good amount. Yeah. One of the things I would, I'd like, I'd like to tack, tack on to that, what you said, the other thing that you learn when you're teaching, or if you're like just engaging with people who are, who are, who haven't been doing it as long as you is that, you know, once you start any, this is true for pretty much any discipline. Once you've done something for a long time, you develop habits, right? The longer you do that, do that habit, the more you think that that's the way it should be done. Right. And one of the things about teaching that's like a nice reset button is sometimes you'll see a student, you'll have a student that does something. It's not quite right, but it works somehow. Right. And you have to, it like makes you rethink every, all of your, presuppositions about what it is that you're doing and say well because you don't want to kill that thing in that student you want to cultivate it you're you want to add a toolbox tool to their toolbox but but the 
but I found many times where I, with students who like when I started teaching, especially in the first couple of years, I had that mindset of, you know, this is the way you do this. This is the right way. This is the, that way is not as good. And then after a couple of years, I realized, well, wait a second. Like that's all just like a, that's a presumption, right? There's no right and wrong about art making. It only works or it doesn't. <laughs> right. And so you can learn a lot about, about how other people see the world and how your narrow view of the world is something you just get used to. You just think it's, you think it's the right way because that's what you're, you're used to. And um, so I reject, I reject that kind of polemicism in, in art making. I, I think, you know, I, in fact, whenever I teach workshops, I always have a preamble to the course where I say, look, this is the way I approach it, right? There are other ways to do this, to make art, right? But this is, this is how I see the, this is how I see the, 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 the material and how I see the form and how I see the subject matter. And you could take what you want. Like if you only get one thing, you get one thing, maybe you take 10 things, but, um, but you know, my job, my job when I'm teaching is to help them recognize their own predilections and once you recognize your own predilections and you compare them to somebody else's now you can fine tune whether you want to move more toward them or away from them mm -hmm. and uh that's really the job of a teacher it's um now that can be i think for some people that can be uh something that turns them off a little bit because they're like they just they just want they just want to sculpt like you right um but, um, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but I always caught to say, look, that's fine, but you have to be cautious because then, you know, do you want everybody to start saying, oh, your piece looks like Brian's, you know, yeah. you know, right. So it's a, this is, look, all, it's really fascinating because what we're talking about here is what makes art both, both really interesting, but also really hard. Yeah. Well, there was a, I was on a committee to select a, uh, artists that were going to put a, a work of art somewhere here in Oklahoma City. And uh, one of the, the applicants, like, look, their work looked exactly like, you know, one of the artists that I worked for. Like, it looked like the background, you know, how it was photographed, you know, how it was mounted, like everything. It, it looked so much like that artist that I was like, I'm surprised that this person submitted. It seems like something he wouldn't submit to. And right. then later on, I found out it was a completely different artist. It was a, a female sculptor. And I, I you know, I, I kind of asked if I could, you know, just send that artist a message. I said, hey, you know, you're really talented. You've got, you know, the great technical ability. I said, you know, right now, you know, this is because we both had the same teacher. I was like, you're kind of struggling finding your own voice because right now I look at it and I see him mm -hmm. and I don't see you. I said, and that's going to be a struggle. I said, I still struggle with it. And it's something that you're going to have to, you know, figure out and you'll be better off for it because it'll be more authentically you. And yeah. you, know, you can take all advice with a grain of salt, but, you know, I, yeah. I think that would help any artist is, you know, finding your own voice. And then on top of that, I met another lady who's a, who's an artist and I think she's like in her fifties and she's just starting out. And she was at an art show and she had, you know, artwork of, you know, black women and everything like that. And they, I kind of let her know, I was like, you know, your technical ability is, is pretty good. The problem mm -hmm. is, is a lot of these look like they were ripped off of Google images and you just, you just redrew them. I said, yeah. you know, what your next kind of phase in life should be, or not phase in life, but your next phase as an artist should be is finding your own voice, find things that interest you. I said, even if it's, you know, just you hanging out with your grandkids and taking your grandkids to, you know, baseball practice. And that's all you want to do. I said, right. fine, but right. you know, make sure it's from you. And right now she's doing, I think that she's doing like these collages of animals mm -hmm. with these abstract designs and things around them. And I let her know, I said, you know, this seems like it's a whole lot more authentically you than the stuff you're doing before. And she says, you know, thank you for noticing that because she feels like the work that she's doing now better represents her than what she was doing before so yeah i mean it's a double-edged sword right that that in like you said like finding your own voice is is part of the goal but of course your voice is going to be resonant with all kinds of antecedent voices mm -hmm. and the question is like how much do you how much do you have to 
change what you're inheriting in order to make it your own. Um, so, so like, like it is, this was a recent thing that just happened with uh, um, uh, Elvis Costello. Did you hear this story? No. Uh, Elvis, there was, what's the song? I can't remember who, it's not, who was the artist? It's not Billie Eilish, but uh, see, I, people are going to watch this and they're going to know. They're going to know. I can't remember who, who it was now, but the, there was a song and her song sounds sound a lot like um, uh, uh, Elvis Costello's song. And people like were on Twitter were saying, you know, uh, you know, like you just ripped you. It's like this obviously influenced by the Elvis Costello and Elvis Costello stepped in and he actually answered the tweet and said, look, this is how art works. She took my song and she made her, she took it and adapted it and made it her own. So stop piling on because I took my, I took it from Bob Dylan who took it from, from, uh, from Chuck Berry. Like yeah. this, that's how it works. You know, art is, the question is how you have, how much of that do you take and turn in, you take the inspiration from somebody from the art form that you've inherited all of your antecedents and start to twist it a little bit so it becomes your own voice. And that, you know, that's, that's what we're all trying to do because, you know, we're, when it, especially when you're working in a, in something that has a long tradition, right? We're, we're working in a media, where sculpt, representational sculpture is very old. <laughs> it's been around, well, creation is very, in general, is very, it goes back 40,000 years or more, right? So the, the, you know, the, the originality is always going to be tempered a little bit by by the fact that you are working within uh, a tradition right and so finding that balance is is key uh i mean any one of us we could we i think any artist you could kind of see who they're who they're inspired by the question is how much are you how far away from it are you getting if it get if it's so close that the person can't recognize the difference between what you've done and the person that you're looking at, well then they're just copying, you're just forging. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So that's that was a big that was a big struggle whenever I was teaching. I was like, you know, uh, don't see a picture, paint a picture, don't see a picture, draw a picture. If you mm. reference three different things and then bring yeah. them all together, and the a good example I was brought up was uh Kahinde Wiley in uh yeah. paintings he would take, you know. European Renaissance masters, and then he would contemporary uh, con contemporize them. Is that the word? Yeah. I don't know. He'd make them more contemporary by you know swapping out with the black, you know, uh, yep. African American, you know, black just in general a lot of times, and then yep. also adding like the the wallpaper background. So I would, yep. say if you're taking from three different things, I mean, eventually you you can move a little, you can move far enough away where you're not plagiarizing but if you just see a picture paint a picture i mean you're yeah you're not paid plagiarizing and it's really hard to get kids out of that mode because they they see something on pinterest they see something on instagram and they want to do that yeah that's a good, good way to that's a good piece of advice is the one way to avoid that kind of plagiarism is is to is to draw from multiple sources yeah <laughs> And because another way to look at it is like Kehinde Wiley, what he's what he's really what he's doing. If you look at it from the, the global perspective and historical perspective, he's adding another layer. Mm -hmm. Like he's taking, adding another layer on it. And then somebody's going to look at him. They're going to take it, add another layer, and then add another layer. And it, we're doing something. We're part of a, a very collective human experience of 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 expression, right? We're trying to we're trying to show all of the multiplicities of viewpoints but how those viewpoints also connect to everybody else that's come before and who's existing today um and yeah i think if you're if you're just gonna if you're gonna be that straightforward about your source material then you're not really adding to you're just you're actually going you're taking it down a layer yeah. you know so good I'm, advice. Really, I'm sorry go ahead that, that was good advice i like what you said so uh, I really want to ask you this question. This was posted by the uh, the National Gallery in London, I believe. Mm. And uh, I'll share the screen with you. And I want you to watch this. And I kind of want to get your reaction with it. And I'm going to tell you straight up the reason I want to get your reaction to it. It's because you do sculpt the nude. Uh, yep. You are a professional sculptor. You've been around. You've observed a whole lot. You're very well read. 
And so uh, I just want to share this with you and, and see what you think. Many naked people in the National Gallery, part one. It might look like everyone's got their kit off in this place. Why? Well, a lot of these paintings are made by men for men. So unsurprisingly, an awful lot of the people with no clothes on are women. That's right. The history of art is monumentally sexist. And on top of that, they tend to call them nudes rather than naked, because naked's just way too gauche. But there is another reason. Have you ever tried to paint or draw a person? It's really hard. We're all experts on what a human body looks like because we all have a human body. If you get even the slightest thing wrong, the whole illusion falls apart. So if you're rubbish at, say, painting knees, just cover it up with a skirt. So if you are painting a fully naked human body from head to toe, you are showing that you have some serious artistic chops. And it might help you answer an age-old debate called the paragone. It's an argument between painters and sculptors. Who's better? Sculptors say, well, we're better because we can depict a human being in full 3D. Whereas painters say, well, anything you can do, we can do as well. We can depict a human body from every possible angle. Well, uh, go ahead and ask the pinpoint what you were, what you were thinking. So that bothered me a whole lot. And the very first thing that bothered me is when he said, you know, art is incredibly sexist because in, the nudes are very prevalent because it's made by men for men. And I, I kind of feel like that's a self-fulfilling statement because if you look back at the, the Kore and the, the Koros from Greek, oh, they were, the men were naked, the women were clothed. And you can apply that statement saying, oh, well, it was made by men for men. So it's a, like no matter what's going on with that statement, when you say everybody's naked because it's viewed from the male perspective, you can fulfill that any kind of way you want. That's and right. I felt like that was incredibly reductive. And honestly, I felt like it was ignorant for him to say that. Um, yeah. That was the main sticking point. The other stuff, you know, I've heard, but I don't. That's kind of one of those deals that's like uh, like the, the Paragone, whatever he was talking about. That's one of those deals that's kind of, it's fun to talk about, but I don't feel like sculptors and painters really even get into that, except for like, I've heard a few stories about Michael right. and Leonardo talking about it, but I don't really feel like we get into that too much as artists. And uh, that was like, that, that first part was my main sticking point, just because it's so reductive and it ignores the vast swath of, art history um right. if we look at like venus wellendorf that's a that's a nude female that's a fertility figure that's made for women uh if you look like said so the greek uh if you look at the the mycen is the mycenaeans or the minoan I believe it's the minoan the men were completely naked the women were clothed except for their breasts were exposed like you can fulfill that statement any kind of way you would like and to me that just seemed like it was incredibly reductive and i couldn't believe that the National Gallery would put something out like that that was just so reductive. So, I don't yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah, there's an interesting thing that phenomenon of the 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 contemporary West of contemporary society today. So I I don't you know this is a very common thing. I've I've become I've become personally very um, very aware and um, and annoyed by this tendency. And by the way, like this tendency of polemicism and, and reductivism is not on one side or the other. This is our this is the way people think now. I, I, I'll just to give you a, a different example, but separate one. I could find myself arguing one day with somebody that's on one side of the coronavirus argument, the very like they 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 know this is all bullshit. They know this is all like, they, they, they know, like if you talk to them, it's as if they know everything about this is just a, it's just a hoax. Whatever. And then the next, and I'll argue with them. The next day I'll encounter somebody's on the other side and I'll start arguing with them. Cause like, you can't make those kinds of reductivist definitive statements. That's not how the world works. This, the world is a conversation right now. Granted, there are some things that we can agree on as people that, that are more definitive than others. Okay, so for example, we've, as a society, decided definitively that murder is not a good thing, right? We just, we've collectively decided we, we, we don't want that. We don't, we don't think that's helpful or, or useful. Um, and so there are things that we can, we can 
obviously there's a spectrum here we can be definitive about some things but this is a tendency that is is so common that people don't even recognize that they're doing it and um this is a perfect example what you just showed because it is reductivistic in 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 many ways so for example the statement the statement this was made by men for men is sometimes true i mean it's like because there's a partial truth in there like yep. it's not not saying something that is that is completely untrue right um but it's the way it's phrased right it's it's uh but it also like you said it ignores the the facts of history which is that the male nude in we in western art the male nude was the dominant art form for almost 2000 years you know the greeks primarily their nudes were, they, they were almost all male um and that legacy went all the way through until the 19th century that was the not only that but models were almost all males mm -hmm. even in and for female subjects were often males uh in in particularly in the renaissance and and a little bit later but um it, it's really it's in the 19th century you, you see a, a significant shift toward the opposite and that's where the the the, the problematic conversation really began but it doesn't it doesn't mean that he's he's 100 wrong yes there is there is a section of of there's a sector of art that that is is like that that it is it was it had a had a particular purpose uh uh served a particular purpose of titillation or whatever it might be right but um but it is very reductivist and it also uh, it also doesn't take into account the um the ways in which those things are depicted like that's the other problem i have with that it's not simply that it it it, a, it reduces it to a necessity like that it, if it depicts um a female nude or a male nude that it necess nece necessarily is was meant was meant for by the male gaze for the male gaze it could be that mm -hmm. it could be that but it also doesn't take into account the way the subject matter and the way that things are depicted okay so for example one of the one, one of the ways one of the things that I do, conditions that I uh, put on myself um, when I'm dealing, when I started doing more female nudes, because I did mostly male nudes for a, the early part of my body of work. I did a lot of self-portraits, actually, nude self-portraits. Um, then I started, get, I wanted to do female nudes because I actually started thinking about this question. It's like, well, is there, what is it that, what is it that makes it about the act of one, like gendered looking, right? what is that what is that what is it about the object or the image that creates that condition and so um so i thought well what if what if it's more recursive than that what if it's actually what if the work is actually about that act of looking and the and the object staring back at you right to use james elkins phrase from his book the object stares back you know that that's became interesting to me now if I change it, it, by simply changing the conditions of how I'm how I'm depicting the subject, it can it can change the way that the viewer is forced into the act of looking. So you can make something voyeuristic by the way you depict it, or you can make it simply a straightforward act of of representation, or you can make it so that the thing is looking is making you aware of the of your act of looking, right? Mm -hmm. so, so it's reductive. It's not only in the sense that it ignores history as you said it ignores the fact that that not everything fits into that category but it also ignores that the the ways in which things are are depicted you could you could be exploitative about anything i mean like there's no there's no there's no reason that you, you that somebody from any culture any time and any gender couldn't exploit some subject matter right but that doesn't mean that because it's not it's not them that it's necessarily exploitative. Um, so uh, there is there there is a lot of art that was made by men for men that was that is voyeuristic and 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 because of the conditions of the society and the way things were made, that's built into the thing, right? So that does exist, but but it it's a really it flattens the whole it flattens out the ways in which things are made. Uh, and the way that things are depicted. So another another thing I think that that I think would is a is a 
an important characteristic from that I use in thinking about this is I don't, I don't think of myself as speaking f- for things, right? I'm not an advocate, right? I, I'm not a, um, uh, I, so, so if I were, if I were, uh, if I were depicting something, I'm not taking on the mantle of being their mouthpiece, that, that thing's mouthpiece, whatever it could be. It could be a mountain, right? My, my, I speak about, about things and I speak not just things like as in objects, but I mean about ideas. I'm speaking about an idea. What is, the, I'm speaking about the idea of looking, about the idea of interacting with the other, right? About the, 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 what it means to be uh, somebody who's, looking at another person right so i i i'm not advocating for them i'm not even advocating for myself or my point of view i'm just i just have one because i'm a human and one of the reasons i like looking at art and i like and i especially like looking at art from different cultures and from different periods and and from different another gender i mean all human experience is so varied my only access into their unique experiences, their expression of that experience, right? And that's what art should do. Art should have, art should should be a place by, wherein we have the chance to communicate with somebody, somebody else's viewpoint on things. They're de- that doesn't mean that they're propagandizing on behalf of the thing. They're, they're just expressing what it meant to be in having that experience with the, it could be even abstract, right? That's why. Well, that's kind of that's a whole other conversation. It could be non-representational. Let's not say abstract. They not. It could be non-representational. So in a certain sense, everything's representational and everything is abstract, right? I mean, this is a whole other blind uh, conversation we could have. But you know, they, it doesn't matter in that sense. It's it's really about is the is it giving me some sort of access into into their way of viewing things. Um, and that's why I love art. You know, I, like I look at all, I look at everything. I literally look at you. If you, a culture I've never seen before, you plop a book down in front of me, I will pour over that book because it's, I'm, I'm, I'm being given a, a very precious access into another human experience that I will never have. It's so important. And so that's part of the representation in, in within the tradition that we're working in that's part of what it should do, right? It's it's an opportunity for me to, to if I'm looking, it doesn't matter if it's a male or female, really, it doesn't matter if, if they have my, my cultural background or not. When I'm, when, I'm, when I'm looking at them in the act of making something, I'm actually trying to shut off myself a little bit and say, what is it they're experiencing in the moment, right? And what, what is it that they are, what is it that they are like feeding back to this in this loop, right? And can I just be like, can I be a conduit for that? And and my experience of looking and interacting and their experience of being there in my presence and and then by proxy in the presence of the viewer in the gallery or a museum or where my wherever it might be, right? And so so I think that's the more nuanced and and complicated version of what he's talking about but again that doesn't mean he's like 100 percent wrong because sometimes you do look at these things and you're like oh that's clearly voyeuristic right it's but it's not it's not always so easily defined either it, it can be it can be really it can be really hard sometimes to see when something's being exploitative and when it isn't it's it's not always it's not always so clear cut in my mind yeah. um and sometimes it is sometimes it's very 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 clearly um meant to be exploited but usually that's the way it's it's not the it's not it's not the subject that's being depicted it's the way it's being depicted right uh i think that's the key thing and that's a that's a much more complicated and difficult conversation to have but i think it's one that unfortunately we're not very well conditioned to have in our culture today i mean it's almost impossible to have an open-ended uh conversation anymore everybody comes in with with as if they're in a debate Everybody, everybody, almost every conversation now you enter into is if it's a debate. And if you suddenly, if you start to poke a hole in, in something that they say that's definitive, they immediately think that you're debating them from the other side. When, you know, most of it's just, to me, it's a conversation. It's an open-ended conversation. You know, not always, of course. There are times when that doesn't 
that doesn't exist, obviously, where it is a debate because it deserves debate, right? Because it's a because it's a subject in which you need to have some some sort of stance, you know, polemical point of view. You know, like if somebody's a flat earther and they're like, hey, with the, the, you know, it's the earth's flat. There's no, we're not revolving around a sun. It's like, uh, you know, okay, wait, that's like, let's, <laughs> there are some things that are kind of settled, but, but you get my point. I think that's, that's one of the problematic things about that video. The other thing that's actually shockingly problematic about that video is the Paragone. He completely describes it wrong. Mm -hmm. it, he, he, what he, he got it completely backwards. See, you can you can educate me on this because when he said that, I was like, I don't. I, the only conversation that I could ever think of was something with Leonardo and Michelangelo, and it's one of those things by uh, Vasari, and you don't even know if that's true or not because right, of course, em embellish everything and make these stories up. So you know, take everything with a grain of salt. So you know, educate me on that because I don't know a whole lot about that. So, so the theoretical, the theoretical foundation for the Paragoni, the, the debate between, between um, uh, imagery, uh, painted, painted imagery and objects, sculpture, is really founded on the idea of illusion. Well, the reason that you know, paint, sculpture was always seen as, well, it, in the Renaissance, all, this begins around the, in the Renaissance, early Renaissance, this, this theoretical debate. Um, it really it's really centered around the idea of illusion that, you know, it was, painting was considered the more, the more elevated intellectual art form because it was, it used illusion to tell a story, to tell the story of the thing that there was being, that was being depicted where sculpture was, was a one-to-one -one relationship, right? That it wasn't, it wasn't using the, the, the illusion of space. That's what, that's the real debate. It's not about, he's got it completely backwards like that's not you know the, the now here's the thing that that debate is kind of done that's kind of ended you know modernism killed off that you know that that it's not even a real like i don't i don't know anybody that argues about that anymore there's a really good book for for viewers who want to read it's um it's called um the world as sculpture by uh I'll think of the name. I'll think of his name. It'll pop in my head some at some point here in this conversation. It's a really good book about this. The way that 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 com that theoretical debate between the the, uh, the Paragone, how that has completely that's shifted. It's shifted away from from that that conversation for a lot of reasons. Obviously, we we have the world is much more complex in its view of what art is now than it was 500 years ago but anyway he got that all wrong that's like that was that 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 actually annoyed me just as much as the first part um but look it doesn't matter i mean the, the, that's not not as vital in a certain sense because the first part of that i think feeds into the first part of what he said it's problematic because it feeds into other kinds of political debates that people are having today which are very, which are very reductivist, and just create enmity between people, and um, and I, I, yeah, that's disturbing to me. I find that part like that's disturbing because I don't think we should be. I'm not, you know, I know that there are ways in which imagery and objects have been used as propaganda to further power structures. I mean, that, that that's not a that's not up for debate. That's pretty obviously true. I mean, that is. Whether it's racial or 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 gender, whatever it might be, um, sexual preference, religion, uh, politics. I mean, you have an art form that falls yeah. right along after it somehow. Right, right. So that that's that's pretty clearly not up for debate. That 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 that, that the fact of that that imagery is used in that way, including in a sexist way. That that that's true. That really exists. But but like you said, the problem here is really the reductivism and yeah. sort of like and also the, the 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 simple historical whitewashing of that statement. That that you know the male nude was was the dominant. You know, in fact, it was for the Greeks. It was like the male nude was the most beautiful. Yeah. In some ways, it's a weirdly opposite sexist view, right? <laughs> like, like they. I mean, if if anything, you could you could you you could go after that more because you could say, oh, they 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 thought that the men were better because they thought they were also more beautiful. Yeah. Which is, you could whatever. I mean, look, you can you could take the 
you can take this any direction you want. Um, but, you know, I mean, we're never, human beings, are, we're evolving and art is evolving as we're evolving. And, um, you know, some things, some granted, there are some things that are going to be offensive that we see. But, uh, you know, I'd like to meet one person who hasn't made a mistake in their life. And, you know, I haven't met them. Well, you know. the other part that was kind of, you know, I, when I look at things, I, I might be a little bit too literal. And I don't know if that's because I'm a figurative sculptor and I, mm. I look at things as they are. And, you know, I like to handle things in a tangible way and a technical way. Um, mm. Another thing that was kind of weird is when he says that, you know, art is sexual, uh, sexist and it's being, it's being portrayed in a, in, through the male lens or whatever, for males or whatever. Uh, the other problem that I have with that is uh, just in terms of the the whole obscenity debate. So a lot of these figures don't have pubic hair. They don't have, you know, armpit hair. Uh, the females, they, they might as well just be Barbie dolls because, you know, you can't see the genitalia. The men, uh, I know in Greek, it was considered beautiful to have really, you know, small, reduced genitals. But then in certain paintings, I'm like, I don't know what that guy is going to do with that thing because that that they reduce it to such a small and, and it's all in a way to avoid any of these obscene kind of notions that we'd have from looking at these at these at these people. And it's easier to avoid that obscenity, you know, just from a, a tangible technical way with the female figure. Uh, if you're right. if you're wanting to hide the genitals and stuff like that with the male figure, I mean, you got to work. You don't have to work a whole lot. Well, you, you yeah. cover you got to cover it up because even sculptures that I've done where the nude the male is nude, uh, mm. I have people say something like, "Oh, he's naked." And I'm like, "Yeah, of course." Or you can see his penis. I'm like, "It'd be even more odd if you couldn't see his penis, right?" Well, don't you think? And Very so that kind of frame of thinking. Whereas if I sculpted a nude female, you know, it's it's breast, well, that's I'm familiar with that type of deal. But there's that kind of thought process that we mm. have seeing more of the genitals is obscene and yeah, that's a really, ignored that as well yeah that's a really interesting thing too that's a that's that shows us like shows us that you know it's our some of our like r puritanical roots are still with us right that but but that's another that's one of the ways to look at that is is to is to look at the um look at those images from that period and see the clear like sublimation of desire right that they're kind of they're they're trying to they're trying to express something in a desirous way but but they also know that they're living in a in a society that has to repress a little bit of that mm -hmm. right so that i mean that always struck me as weird too when you go when i go and see like a female nude from the 19th century like they're clearly like sh sh trying to show the sensuality of this and that they hide the like yeah. it's like a barbie doll it's like what what's going on there so there's a in some ways that makes it more interesting that that sense of tension that exists within that it's like it's like they want to express that that aspect of human nature but they but they have to hold back a little bit right mm -hmm. um but um so in some ways that makes it more interesting from you know just from the anthropological point of view but um yeah this is not a clear cut none of this is clear cut i mean this is a yeah, this is a an ongoing thing. Um, not look, I've had I've had probably more trouble on social media censoring my male nudes mm -hmm. than the females. I mean, I've done had I've probably done the more female nudes in terms of volume. Um, so so there was, but but like early on, I couldn't post it. I couldn't post a male nude like like full frontal nude without without it getting taken down. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, which is, you know, that's a whole, there's, there's a whole other topic of conversation there around, around, um, around sexuality, you know, when, when is a, when does a subject become, become, you know, the nude doesn't ne necessitate a sexual connotation, no. right? Uh, in the same way that, that, that looking at, uh, looking at somebody, looking at somebody who's, has a uh, different gender, doesn't mean that you're necessarily looking at them with a kind of with a kind of um, 
um, sexualized point of view. You could be, you could be, it's a, it's a risk, but, uh, but again, I'm, I'm generally, uh, I'm just not in favor of censorship. Like, like let people, let people make their mistakes and correct them. <laughs> well, my art teacher in high school, he said, there's, there's naked, there's nude, and then there's porn. And he said, naked, you just hop out of the shower. You're just kind of there. Nude is you're posing for, you know, a work of art. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there's an intention to, uh, not sexualize and you're not just naked just to be naked you're trying to make a nice work of art and then there's porn where the obvious intention is to uh in, entice somebody's you know sexual urges and things like that and i don't right. know if that's a great rule but you know as a high school kid i was like oh okay that makes sense i understand that <laughs> it's a good starting point yeah. it's at least but you know but always when it's within that just like everything else we've said the lines between those are not always clear. Yeah, definitely. The line, it's not always clear, and I mean, this is a we could. This is a probably much too big of a topic for for this time frame. But you know, the with the difference between the porno, pornographic and the erotic, right? What is the is there a difference? What is the difference? I don't think we can go there with this, but but I because I don't even think it's necessary in a certain way because I, you know what I for me one of the reasons I like the nude is it's is that it's it's the it's most animal in a way right and by that i don't mean to, to say that there is it's actually the it's it's present in in an animal sense like and i think that for me that's what i'm trying to do with it i'm trying to find a language to talk about the 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 basic human basics of human nature and our spiritual aspirations and how that it's kind of the look think of michelangelo right he was a he was he was at least heavily influenced by neoplatonic thought so it might seem like it might seem like a paradox that what he's doing is he's depicting a lot of the form, figures that he depict depicted a lot of the forms that he used he's depicting the, the, the physical human form as a way of showing his aspiration to shed it. Because he was, he was, you read his poetry, he was clearly heavily influenced by Neoplatonism and a dualism built into that, where he wanted to, he wanted to escape the earthly body and in order to, in order to enter into some higher spiritual plane, which is, which sounds like a paradox. He's, he's using the human form as a way of showing his struggle with the act, what it means to be human. That's why these, all of these, like these male figures with these like intensely overwrought forms is a way, is a language, a formal language for showing all of the internal tension that he's trying to, that he's trying to depict, right? It's not really about the figure in a certain sense. It's about the, what it means to be an embodied, an embodied being, right? Which is what we are. And so that's what I'm, that's to me, the more interesting thing about it. It's not, it's not about the, you know, the, the, that's why, you know, that's why I don't, I don't depict people doing everyday things. And then I'm not saying there's anything wrong, but by the way, like anything I say, I'm talking about like my current state in my thinking about my work, not anybody else's, right? There's nothing wrong with having a more Aristotelian, quotidian, like depiction of human activity right i don't there's nothing wrong with that i'm not saying that's not what people should do i'm just saying for myself when i'm when i'm thinking about the new the human body and human form and all the tradition that comes of depiction of the human form through history in sculpture that i that i'm a part of i'm really in a way more interested in the abstractions right the 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 that the the model is a source for something some other idea. Um, and so in a certain sense, it's, it's almost like, I think some people would look at, look at some of my pieces that are like very straightforward and they would make the assumption it's just about that, that interaction between the object looking back, as I said earlier, but, but there are others that are doing, if you think about them from your human experience point of view, they're completely nonsensical, right? That obviously a figure can't float upside down or, um, why would a naked person be holding a fire extinguisher, right? It's, it's symbolic. It's not, it's not about, um, it's not simply about, um, you know, de de depicting a, uh, 
like a the human sexuality and being that that um, precise about it. It's more about some sort of the form, the human form is some sort of narrative component within within uh, a larger aspirational view. But um, that's hard to do. I mean, it's it's, re- it's like I think half the time I fail, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that's but that's the nature of it. Like you never like you're never going to get successes without the failures. It's just the way it is. You you just have to accept that. You know, there. Yeah. Sometimes I look back at older pieces. I'm like, oh gosh, I wish I could like redo that, like rethink that whole idea. But that's it. That's the yeah. That's yeah. Every 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 step along the way is just that's all it is. One step. So. Well, I, um, I feel like artists. I feel like everything I do, like after I step back for a while, is is a piece of crap. And I think <laughs> I think every artist struggles with that. I think uh, so. But. Uh, I think some one 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 artist I talked to said, you know, you gotta you gotta just do as best you can, and then move mm-hmm. on because if you stay stuck on one piece, you don't progress. And I even had a student; she was a very talented girl, and I I tried my hardest to get her to just finish this painting and move on to the next one, but she got so obsessed with making everything perfect yep. that she I know that. overworked it, and it just it just went downhill from her overworking it. Yep. Yep. That's it. It's like, hey, it's a human. It's a human feeling. It's a human problem. I totally understand where she's. You know, I, I, I've done the same, and I've also done the opposite, where I just get, I get angry and destroy it. Yeah. Although I don't do that anymore, that was when I was beginning. Now I don't do that. I, I sort of think, you know, just let it, let it be. It'll, it'll eventually reveal itself. Um, but it's an acceptance of the. It's an acceptance of the fact that the, the human experience is not. It's a confusing. It's mostly baffling. Like, th- th- this is maybe where the that kind of getting back to the, the where we're 15, 20 minutes ago in the conversation about that kind of reductivism. I think that's my maybe my the heart of my problem with it is most of human experience is baffling, and and it's not so clear cut. I wish it was. Like I wish somebody would just come into my studio and say, "Hey, if you do this, this is it. This is like." But it's the journey. It's the questioning. It's the it's the 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 misdirections and the redirections, and that's what makes it human. That's what makes it interesting, and hopefully, that's what makes people engage with what we do. But um, you know, anybody who chooses to be an artist, I think, is pretty brave because yeah. you're putting yourself out there, and you know that you're going to do things that you that you are like, ah, that's not that didn't hit the mark. Um, whether it's technical or conceptual, you know, you're going to, you're going to, that's, you're going to miss the mark and you, you can't get too hung up on that. Um, in fact, in some ways I see that as like, I, I enjoy it more now, now that I've been doing it long enough, when I see things miss the mark, I, I kind of enjoy it in a weird way. I'm like, cause I learn from it. I'm like, like in a certain way, you could say nothing like that is ever a mistake. Mm-hmm. The mistake is when you don't learn from it. Yeah, <laughs> the mistake responds to it is not the thing that you've done, right? Um, but um, unfortunately, we live in a world that doesn't give us that room. Yeah. And we just, uh, yeah, we don't we don't live in that in that kind of that kind of ambiguity. I mean, uh, but I'm a I'm like I'm a uh, I'm an I'm an agnostic. And I think, you know, and the more I go through life, the more I feel like I move even towards skepticism. But um, I, I try to keep myself sort of in that agnostic space where I think, oh, I don't really know. And my job as a human is, is not to, to have all the answers, to know everything. It's to, to, it's to be part of this human experience in the most empathetic way I can, basically. Yeah. That, well, that's it. Uh, We've been talking for about an hour, and I know you got to head on out. So, yeah, uh, go ahead. And, can you go ahead and just uh, tell us what you're what you're getting ready to do next? Uh, and sure. if you want to drop any of your socials and everything like that. And and by the way, I'll have everything kind of swipe in and out. It'll look real professional. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so, so go Great. ahead and tell us what you're getting ready to do next. And uh, yeah, well, I have uh, art. Like in terms of my my artwork. I have a lot of projects going on, but I don't have any shows planned. Um, 
I mean, it's been, it's COVID, this COVID period has been kind of difficult for that for me. Some people have done well, but I, ha- it's been hard for me. Um, but I am planning, I have, you just have to follow me on the social media to see, you know, my, my Instagram is just my name, Brian Booth, Craig Sculptor. Uh, and then you can find me on Facebook, same thing. Um, but so th- that'll kind of slowly reveal itself, the projects I'm working on. They're really very different from what I was doing pre-pandemic. Okay. Uh, although the shift in ideas was happening before the pandemic, you're just going to see like a bit of a shift in my, I, my conceptual process. Um, but uh, so in that regard, that's a little bit ambiguous what I just said, but that just <laughs> will hopefully follow along. But uh, in terms of the other things I have going on, I, I, I am getting back to teaching, uh, traveling and teaching. COVID shut that down, but I have uh, some sculpture classes in Rome in May. That I'm that I'm going to be teaching. I have two classes here in my studio in Pennsylvania, is where I live. Uh, that I'll be teaching in the summertime: a figures class and a portrait class. I'm planning right now to go to um, uh, do a course in Brazil, hopefully one in in um, Peru as well, uh, and Australia. Be going to Australia. I'm planning that for. It looks like the the Brazil class will probably be like October, November. Uh, Australia in September, most of September. And hopefully back to South Africa again soon as well to teach a, teach a couple courses. But that one's a little, that's still, they don't have any dates for that yet. So just stay tuned for those things. Um, what else do I have? Oh, so I'm, I'm going to be going to France tomorrow. As I told you earlier, I have a, I have a, uh, a sculpture in a, in a group exhibition that uh, it's a traveling group exhibition. It's going, going to museums around the world. And right now it's, in, it's going to be opening in Lyon, France. A lot of great artists in that show. So if you get a chance, people get a chance to see it as it travels around the world, pay attention. It's Ron Muick, Evan Penny, um, Sam Jinx, um, uh, lots of lots of like well-known representational sculptors, mostly working in the hyper-real tradition, although it's, it's kind of a broad, a little broader than that. Uh, and I have a piece in that show. So I'm going to be going for the opening of that. Uh, and that's about it right, right now. I Hopefully I can start planning an exhibition soon. But um, but that might take a, take another year before before work is ready for it. Uh, what else do I have going on? No, that's about it. Yeah, those are the classes and 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 work that I'm doing. All so, right. Well, that all sounds good, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording. <laughs> and I really yeah. appreciate it.